Hello, fellow historians. This lecture concerns the conquest of Mexico. When the most militaristic, powerful nation and army comes to bear on the most militaristic um, empire in the New World, the Spanish against the Mexica, the Aztecs. Cortez lands in what is today Veracruz in 1519, and by 1521, the capital of the Mexica Empire, Tenochtitlan, is destroyed, laid in ruins, and many of the, the Mexica are, are killed. But this also lays a foundation for the modern state of Mexico and the modern uh, Mexican people. So we will cover several major points of the conquest of Mexico. The conquest of Mexico, 1519 to 1521. When conquistador Hernan Cortes lands in Veracruz, or what is now Veracruz, it wasn't called that then, he names it Veracruz, in 1519, and by 1521, Cortes and approximately 400 Spanish conquistadors and several thousand native allies, mostly from Tlaxcala, conquer Tenochtitlan, which is the capital of the Aztec or Mexica Empire. The conquest, to me, is one of the greatest human dramas in world history, and there are many, of course. Um, and one of, the, one of the greatest tragedies, I think, when the Spanish first lay eyes on Tenochtitlan, according to Bernal Diaz del Castillo, who was there with Cortes, he said that the conquistadors he was with could not believe their eyes, that Tenochtitlan was the most beautiful city they had ever seen. And as conquistadors, um, they had seen many cities in, in Europe, but they said Tenochtitlan was the most beautiful. They had to pinch themselves because they thought they were dreaming. And they destroy it. They destroy the civilization and it lay in ruins. But it also lays a foundation for the modern nation and people of Mexico. The conquest of Mexico. This first reading is from the first letter of Hernando Cortez. Um, to Queen Doña Juana and the Emperor Charles V, her son, written on July 10th, 1519. So this is the first year that Cortes is in Mexico, marching toward um, Tenochtitlan, which he will eventually conquer in 1521. This is from his first letter, describing um, the native peoples that he has encountered and how they should be dealt with. His holiness may thus see fit to permit evil and rebellious people having first been warned to be proceeded against and punished as enemies of our holy Catholic faith. Such punishment serving as a further occasion of warning and dread to those who still rebel. Now what Cortez is describing is that when, when the Spaniards are marching in toward Mexico, every new people, tribe, city, town they encounter, um, the priest in Spanish, um, but also with the interpreter, Doña Marina or La Malinche, um, preach the gospel to the natives. Essentially, this is Jesus Christ, this is the gospel, um, convert or die. This is essentially how the, the Spanish are presenting um, Catholicism to the natives. So Cortez is saying to the emperor, um, there, if, if, if the natives still are rebellious after they hear the gospel, then they should be dealt with as enemies of the cross, enemies of the church, enemies of, the, of, of Spain. I'll read on. Such punishment serving as a further occasion of warning 
and dread to those who still rebel, and thus bringing them to a knowledge of the truth, and rescuing them from such great evils as are those which they work in the service of the devil. So the Spanish, the Spanish believe they are fighting the devil in the new worlds. And I'll, I'll, I'll read on. And for in addition to those which we have already, already reported to your majesties, in which children and men and women are killed and offered in sacrifice, we know and have been informed without room for doubt that all of them practice the abominable sin of sodomy. So in his first letter, Cortez is describing native peoples, and he's describing them in very um, bad ways, right? He's, he's saying they are in the service of the devil, they are sacrificing their children, and they all practice sodomy. Um, I won't describe what sodomy is. If you don't know, look it up, Google it. These are the great sins um, that anyone could commit at this time, right? It's to sacrifice their children and also um, to be a sodomite, to be a homosexual. This is what, this is essentially what Cortez is saying. In, in, in our terminologies, what Cortez is saying, they're, they're all a bunch of gay child killers. And when the emperor hears this, and, uh, and those back in Spain hear this, um, this re it reinforces uh, their idea that, um, this, that God has hand chosen the Spanish to fight the devil around the world. And this is what the conquistadors believe, that they're fighting a bunch of gay child killers. The second reading is from um, Bernal Diaz del de Castillo's account um, the, true con the true history of the conquest of New Spain. He wrote it in his 80s. He was there with Cortez as Cortez was marching in toward Tenochtitlan. And this is what, this is an excerpt from his book. He, he talks about Pedro Alvarado, which was Cortez's right-hand lieutenant. And the, the, concert, um, the butcher of, of Guatemala, he says, when Pedro de Alvarado reached these towns, he found that they had all been deserted the same day. And he found in the, in the temples bodies of men and boys who had been sacrificed, and the walls and, and altars stained with blood. And the hearts placed his offerings before the idols. He also found the stones on which the sacrifices were made and the stone knives with which to open the chest so as to take the heart out. Pedro de Alvarado said that he found most of the bodies without arms, without legs, and that he was told by some Indians that they had been carried off to be eaten. And our soldiers were astounded with, at such great cruelty. I will not say any more of the number of sacrifices, although we found the same thing in every town we afterwards entered. So what Diaz is saying, as you just heard, um, every town that they encountered on their march toward Tenochtitlan had temples stained with blood where bodies were found dismembered. This is what he is reporting. This is from the Spanish point of view. So imagine you're there with Cortez, and you see these things, and, and, it, and they're amplified because you already believe you're fight, fighting the devil. And you're marching under the banner of the Virgin Mary. What are you thinking? Do you, can you see how they would have thought they were fighting the devil? And we have to ask ourselves also, is, is Diaz exaggerating? This is from a, a Spanish point of view. They believe they're fighting God's, God's war against Satan. Are we to believe Diaz's account? As historians, how do we take his account 
as being factual. Well, we would look at other, other accounts, right? But then in other accounts also are written by, by the Spanish. And, uh, and if, if not completely Spanish, many of the accounts are written by mestizos, who are the offspring of Spanish conquistadors and native women who grow up in a Catholic European tradition after the conquest, and then try to make sense of the conquest by writing histories from a Catholic mestizo point of view, even though their mothers are native. What kind of questions do we have to ask ourselves when we read their accounts? We also have archeology. span Does archeology span bear witness that, that there were human sacrifices? Yes, archeology span does bear witness that there were human sacrifices, right? Going all the way back, we, we have found human, human remains that were sacrificed at Teotihuacan before the Aztecs. We have found human sacrificial remains um, at Tenochtitlan or the Templo Mayor in Mexico City. But were they amplified by the Spanish? Were they exaggerated? Or does it matter, right? A human sacrifice is human sacrifice. Does it matter to us whether there were human sacrifices, but the Spanish amplified them? What kind of questions do we have to ask ourselves if that's the case? Here's a famous quote by Cortez. Um, we'll get to this later. When Cortez and his men finally entered Tenochtitlan into the palace of Montezuma, Cortez tells Montezuma, <laughs> this is what he says, I and my companions suffer from a disease of the heart, which can be cured only with gold. And then they proceed to rob the Mexica of their gold. Hernan Cortez. Here's a famous painting of the, of the conquest from the second half of the 17th century. And of course, in the lower right-hand corner, it shows, it shows Cortez larger than life um, and his conquistadors fighting on the causeways. The causeways were the, the land bridges um, connecting uh, the mainland with the island um, fortress capital, Tenochtitlan. And here they are on horseback uh, fighting the natives. And you see there, there are ships, there are Spanish ships on the, on the lake. And we'll get to that later. It's an amazing military feat that Cortez um, accomplishes during this final stage of the conquest. Imagine hearing the, the cannon of the ships going off, that loud noise, the screams, the shouting, um, the conquistadors and natives on the ground crying and yelling for their mothers just because this is what soldiers do when they die. Um, they yell for their mothers. The entrails hanging out. Uh, the natives fighting tooth and nail to the last. And um, over here, the Mexica fighting off um, conquistadors and the native allies. This would have been 1521, the final battles of, of the siege. Here we see Tenochtitlan and the Great Temple. The Great Temple dedicated to Tlaloc and Huitzilopochtli. Here's a conquistador with a banner, uh, most likely a banner of the Virgin Mary. That, that was the main banner they, that they fought under. And the banner of Castile. Look at this image. This, look at these soldiers coming down from heaven to aid in the battle. Right? Because, of course, the Spanish believed that God was on their side. They believed they were fighting, fighting the devil and the forces of Satan in the new world. And God was on their side. The heavenly host, Santiago, St. James, was the patron saint of warfare during this time. The Virgin Mary, but also um, Santiago. There we have um, several um, eyewitness accounts throughout the medieval period in Spain and also during the conquest when soldiers say they looked up in the sky and they saw St. James fighting alongside them from heaven, Santiago. 
His, his name, his full name was Santiago Matamoros, St. James the Muslim Killer. And there are towns in Mexico named Matamoros, right? It's just, it, that comes from Santiago. Matamoros means Muslim killer. Slayer of Moors. Here's a map showing um, Cortez's roots when he, as he lands over here in Veracruz. Again, he named it Veracruz um, when he first lands. Actually, he lands down here and sails up to what is now Veracruz. And this is his marching route. And one by one, as he encounters different tribes, um, the conquistadors um, oft, very often during this march um, battle against native, native peoples, battle and also um, commit genocide. There, there are a few occasions where Cortez and his men are essentially butchers and they, they slaughter hundreds and thousands of, of people. In, in total, thousands. Um, during the march, hundreds here, hundreds there. Um, I think at Cholula, there were a, a, a few thousand. Here's the march. The Tlaxcalans, at first fought Cortez, but then became his allies because the Tlaxcalans hated the Aztecs. And in my previous lecture on the Aztecs, I talk about um, one of the reasons why Cortez was successful in conquering the Mexica is because of the native allies that joined Cortez to fight and destroy the Aztecs. Why would other native peoples in Mexico hate the Aztecs? Well, nobody likes to be conquered, right? No one wants to be part of an empire. Um, that, that's oppressive. This happened during the Roman Empire. There were rebellions throughout the Roman Empire from Judea to, to Britain and throughout, throughout the Celtic regions in what is now France. And of course, the Germans um, fought the Romans um, so fiercely that the, the Romans never, were never able to incur, make an incursion into Germany because the Germans hated the Romans so much, did not want to be conquered by their empire. Um, but other areas were Gaul, which is in modern day France and Britain. Um, the Romans got as far as um, the borders of Scotland and the Scots fought them off. The point is, no one likes to be part of an empire. It, the initial brutal attacks of an empire are debilitating, right? People die, um, your father dies, your, your uncles die. Your, your, your sisters are raped. But the lingering effects of empire, the imposition of taxes, um, cripples communities. And the Aztec Mexica tax men would go out to the outlying communities and exact taxes for the empire, the imperial seat in land. And often part of the taxes were giving, was to give young people to be sacrificed at the great temple. Think about that. You're a parent, you're a mother in one of these communities that had been conquered by the Aztecs. And the tax man comes and says, you, you must give us your daughter or your son because we are going to sacrifice them. How do you feel? I think a great resentment grows up in the hearts of these people because they resent the taxation, especially the taxation to give their young people to be sacrificed. There are a few names that we should know from the conquest, right? One is Hernan Cortez. The second is Montezuma. Montezuma, there are various ways to spell his name. Um, he is the last sovereign Aztec emperor. There was another after him, um, Cuauhtémoc, who reigns, who was the who was made emperor during the conquest. But Montezuma was emperor before Cortez lands, and he is the emperor that's taken hostage by Cortez, the last sovereign reigning Tlatoani. That was the name they used for the emperor, right? We have the pharaoh in Egypt, the Tlatoani in Mexico. Um, and emperors throughout the world have been given different names, right? We had the Caesars in Rome, 
the Kaisers, um, the Tsars in Russia, and incidentally, Tsar and Kaiser both mean Caesar, um, and various other titles throughout the world. But he's the last reigning Tlatawani of the Aztec people. He's captured by Cortez. When Cortez finally comes into Nostilan, uh, Montezuma receives him as a brother. We have native sources where Montezuma says, um, welcome into Tenochtitlan, my brother. And he invites him into his palace. And the conquistadors can't believe how beautiful Tenochtitlan is. There are beautiful gardens. There are apiaries. Um, there are what look like zoos. Um, it's clean. There's advanced sanitation and drainage and waterways. Um, and, and flower gardens everywhere. And the conquistadors are in awe of its splendor and beauty. And they're invited into Montezuma's palace and immediately they take him hostage and begin to demand gold. He dies in 1520, a year before the conquest is complete. Tragically, tragically. Cortez, Hernan Cortez, um, and there are various ways you can look at this man. Um, of course, you can't, it's hard to get past um, that he destroyed a civilization. Explorer, adventurer, missionary. It's hard to see him as, as a missionary, right? If you read his letters, he, he, he at least writes, and we don't know if he actually believed this, we can't get into his head, but he writes that he is spreading the gospel, that he is doing God's work in the name of um, the church, in the name of um, the, his sovereign lords, and in the name of the Virgin Mary, he is spreading the gospel of Christ. And he brings priests with him to spread that gospel. Opportunist, destroyer of civilizations, a Christian general, conquistador, and first, first governor of New Spain. He leads a group of approximately 400 conquistadors. The number fluctuates. At first, there's about 400, and a, a couple hundred more join him um, midway through the conquest, but generally about 400, a few hundred on conquistadors. At first, uh, about 1,000 Tlaxcalan allies, and then that number increases during the final siege. They captured and destroyed the Mexica, the Mexica capital and laid the foundation for the modern nation of Mexico. Born in Medellin, Medellin, Spain, to a lesser noble family. He was educated. He was able to read Latin. He knew the classics. Um, he was a reader. He inspired Francisco Pizarro to conquer the Incan Empire. After the conquest, um, the history was written, written and placed in a library in Spain. And there Pizarro read about the, the conquest of Cortes. And he was so inspired that he went and conquered the Incan Empire and essentially followed um, Cortez's recipe book for conquest and um, step by step does what Cortez does, enters Incan capital, takes Alto Wapa prisoner and demands gold, just like Cortez did um, by his playbook. Here's a statue, a modern statue of Cortez in Medellin, Spain. Of course, the statue of Cortez, like other statues that are um, controversial um, objects in America, um, the statue of Father um, Serra in California, statues of Columbus, and of course we know statues of Confederate um, leaders like General Lee are objects of controversy. And every year um, this statue was um, doused with red paint to signify that he uh, murdered thousands or is responsible for the death of a civilization. La Balinche. So we have Montezuma, Hernan Cortez, and the third major figure I'd like you to know is La Malinche. When Cortez first lands um, in the southern region of what is now Mexico, um, where the Maya thrived, he encounters a Mayan um, um, towns, and he is given a slave girl as, as a present. And her name, her name, her name was Malinche, or Malancin, or Doña Marina. Um, various sources give her different names. And here she, she, she's depicted in a codex with Cortez. I am always surprised in how large she is portrayed. 
Um, she's often portrayed larger than Cortez. Well, let's ask ourselves why. Why would she be portrayed as larger than Cortez? This is really fascinating to me. It gives her power. It's, it certainly gives her power. Whoever is drawing these, co these codices and drawing her larger than life or larger than Cortez is imbuing her with, with some sort of power. Um, she definitely wielded power during the conquest. She helped conquer Tenochtitlan. She's a very intelligent woman. She knew her own Mayan dialect and, and Nahuatl, which is the language of the Aztecs. And, she all, and then she quickly learned Castilian Spanish. So she was trilingual and was able to act as an interpreter to Cortez wherever they went. They had a child together named Martin, and he is one of the first mestizos, the first real Mexican, right? Because this is, Mexico is a mestizo nation. Martin is one of the first uh, modern Mexicans to be born from Cortez and La, Ma La Malinche. Now she's also a controversial figure in today's Mexico, right? Uh, Mexicans re refer to themselves as hijos de la chingada. Um, I'll let you um, translate that. <laughs> Hijos de la chingada, referring to that Mexicans are all sons of that bitch because they see her as a traitor. Now, in, in, recently in um, Latina and Chicana classes, um, she's been interpreted as a very strong and positive role model that just that took control of her destiny. It's up to you to decide. I'm not going to tell you how to interpret her. You choose for yourself. A Nahua woman from the Mexican Gulf Coast has served a large role in the Spanish conquest of Mexico, acting as an interpreter, advisor, lover, and intermediary with Cortez. She was one of 20 slaves given to Cortez by the natives of Tabasco in 1519. She spoke Nahuatl, a Mayan dialect, and quickly learned Spanish, making her trilingual. A mistress to Cortez, she gave birth to his first son, Martin, who, who was considered one of the first mestizos. Hijos de la chingada, according to Octavio Paz. The Mexican people, the sons of Malinche, he writes, have not forgiven La Malinche for her betrayal. What do you think? A traitor? Are Mexicans hijos de la chingada? Or was she a strong woman who, was, who took control of her destiny? And all, although she helped um, destroy the Aztec nation, um, she is a founder of the modern Mexican nation, isn't she? She gave birth to one of the first mestizos, the first Mexican people, modern Mexicans. Here's a larger picture of that. I think that's the same image. Yeah, looks like it. Or no, it's a similar image. It's different, but it's, a, it's similar. Here are native peoples approaching Cortez, giving them gifts. This could be Montezuma's envoy. Several times during the conquest, as, as Cortez is marching toward Tenochtitlan, Montezuma sends um, gold to Cortez. And he, he tells his envoys to tell Cortez, here, here, here's some gold, now go back home. Leave us, please, take this gold and leave. What do you think Cortez is thinking when he receives these gifts of gold as he's marching to Tenochtitlan? Does Cortez say, oh, here's some gold, okay, let's go back home? No, of course not. He says, Wow, look at all this gold. Let's go get some more. Right, this is a mis Montezuma makes several mistakes like this during Cortez's march. Um, he's indecisive. If we can believe the native sources, he's very indecisive on what to do. We know that there's one theory that says that at this time, the, the Mexica, the Aztecs, were expecting um, the white bearded god Quetzalcoatl to come back. And when Cortez, when Cortez lands, the Mexica believe that this is quite possibly Quetzalcoatl returning to us. Now, this, this myth has, um, has been criticized in recent years by historians who say that this myth was uh, made up post-conquest by na surviving natives who, who were converts to Catholicism and European culture who were trying to make sense of the conquest and place it into some kind of Christian cosmology that in fact, um, this myth did not exist and, and, and Montezuma did not, was not expecting a white bearded god. Um, the jury's still out, although most historians believe that it was a made up um, idea after the conquest. Not, nevertheless, 
um, Montezuma was indecisive, whether he thought Cortez was Quetzalcoatl or not. Um, he, he didn't know what to think of these people. Were they here to destroy us? Were they here to, to bring us some sort of um, new technology? He's, he's beside himself with doubts and indecisiveness. His people see this, and they see, these, they see his indecisiveness. And one account says that uh, Montezuma was, was killed by his own people um, during the conquest when, when Cortez takes him captive. And the word gets out in the capital that Montezuma is a prisoner of Cortez. And once the Mexica know that he is a prisoner, uh, Montezuma loses respect and power in their eyes because he is no longer a strong ruler. His indecisiveness has caused him to take, has caused him to become a prisoner. And as a prisoner, he loses all power as Tlatoani and is simply the man Montezuma. And he comes out on the balcony to speak to them and rocks a throne and um, hit him in the head and he dies. That's one account of how he dies. Here is Marlinche once again. Look how large she is. Um, her head goes above Cortez's war horse. So that would make her around seven or eight feet tall. Um, she was not that tall. But in the imagination of this chronicler, this codex artist, she is, she is I think she's almost a goddess. She is very powerful a powerful instrument of conquest. She's a native like these men and she is taller than the natives and she's taller than a horse. Look how large she is here. You can really see the, the contrast between Cortez. Cortez looks like a midget compared. She's giant. What else can you see in this image that represents native culture? So on the left-hand side, we have Cortez's conquistadors, and we have Cortez's Tlaxcalan allies. You can see that these are natives. These are natives mixed in with the conquistadors on, Cort on Cortez's side. What about these natives? It's a very satanic, devilish-looking emblem, isn't it? It shows the contrast between good natives over here and bad ones who are treacherous under the spell of the devil. And La Malinche, twice the size, not only taller, but in bulk, right? She's very bulky. She's powerful. Like, like the Mexica gods, the way the gods are portrayed, Huitzilipochtli, Coatlicu, um, Quetzalcoatl, these are giant gods carved in, from large masses of stone, powerful, bulky, muscular, ready to destroy. This is how La Malinche is portrayed. Very powerful, powerful woman. If, if Mexicans now excoriate her for being a traitor, at this time she is seen as a very powerful woman. Here we are again, another codex, this time in Tenochtitlan, when Cortez first encounters a Montezuma. Another map, because I like maps, is showing um, the, the route that Cortez takes. Here's Tlaxcala. That was never conquered by the Mexica. The Tlaxcalans were enemies with the, with the Mexica. Cholula. At this time, Cholula was a pilgrimage site for devotees of Quetzalcoatl. And we know from our previous lecture in the, of the Olmecs, Quetzalcoatl, the serpent, the feathered serpent dragon god, of, of course they didn't call him a dragon, that's a European word, um, the feathered serpent deity, um, has been venerated and worshipped ever since Olmec times. Even though we don't know what the Olmecs called him, they, they had his representation there. And at this time, Cholula was a major site of Quetzalcoatl worship. Um, his effigy, his, his statue was everywhere. There was a major temple dedicated to Quetzalcoatl. And also Cholula um, witnesses a great slaughter of, um, of native peoples by, by the Spanish. 
It's wholesale slaughter. Terrible. Here is the banner, the exact banner that Cortez used during the conquest. And this is the, another figure I want you to know. So we have Hernan Cortez, Montezuma, La Malinche. Now we have the Virgin Mary. She played a major role in the conquest. And although she wasn't a person, her presence, her, her role is as major as La Malinche's. Here are some of her titles, Holy Mary, Mother of God, Queen of Heaven, Mother of God, Mother of Mercy, Mother of Sorrow, Star of the Sea, Our Lady. Which many of her names parallel names, similar names to Aztec deities. More than, J more than Jesus or Santiago Matamoros, St. James and Muslim killer, Mary acted as a Spanish war god during the Reconquista in Spain and conquest of Mexico. Mary led her troops against Islam in Spain and against satanic forces in the New World, against the Aztecs and other indigenous cultures, who the Spanish believed were under the spell of the devil. Mary's role during the conquest was so powerful that she was quickly adopted by native peoples as a syncretic, powerful mother goddess in the guise of Our Lady of Guadalupe, a combination of the Nahuatl deity Tonantzin and the European Mary, Mother of God. Now, let me ask you this question. I asked this question in the previous lecture on the Aztecs. How, how was the major deity of the Christian religion portrayed during this time, and even now? So how is, I would say, Jesus, I, I, I'm not coming from a, a strict theological Christian um, viewpoint, right? We know that Christians believe there's the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and there's, a, there's a very strict theology in how you venerate and worship and and pray to Mary or not Mary if you're Protestant or to, to the Father. You don't pray to the Holy Ghost, we pray to Jesus. I'm talking in very practical terms. Mary is a God, the way she is used here. But Jesus is the main God in the Christian cosmology next to God the Father. How is Jesus portrayed? Think about this. I want you to, this, 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 is, this is a war of images and powerful images. So on the one hand, you have you have Quetzalcoatl, you have Huitzilopochtli, you have Quetzalcoatl, and how are these gods portrayed in a real sense on temples in the cities? As I said, they're carved from powerful stones, going all the way back to the Olmecs, right? These leaders are powerful. They're they're huge heads. You can't get any more powerful than a huge ten foot head. That's just screams power. Well, this is how the Mexica gods are portrayed. They're powerful. You approach them in fear, in reverence, shaking on your knees, begging for mercy. This is the type of gods they are. They want blood in order to keep blessing your civilization. Every day, who it's the poach, they need blood. We covered this in the previous lecture on the Aztecs. Compare that to how the main God of the Christian religions prayed Jesus, uh, portrayed Jesus. What two, way, how, what two ways is Jesus portrayed? One, as a baby, right? That's the first way Jesus... The most helpless state in human existence, a newborn baby. A newborn baby, think about that. When you compare that representation to the gods of the Mexica. The most helpless state of a human being. If you knew, if you knew nothing about Christian theology and spirituality and the whole the whole tale of resurrection and forgiveness and even the idea of sin, how do you explain sin to someone from a civilization who doesn't have this idea of sin and redemption and baptism and this intellectual kind of religion? The Mexica know what a God should look like. It should be powerful. A baby, it is not powerful. What's the, what's the other way that Jesus is portrayed? As a dying man or a dead man nailed to two pieces of wood. That doesn't convey power either. 
But this image of Mary conveys power. The Mexica know what the sun represents. The sun is the main god. And here is this goddess with the stars around her head. She's the queen of heaven. This is something that the Mexica respect. And she has a crown and she has the sun behind her. This is, this is the goddess of the sun to the Mexica. When they, when, when, they would have, when they saw her banner, this is what they would have thought. Because they, are, they already have a cosmology that involves the sun in deities in the heavens. Babies and dead men on crosses do not convey power. But a, a, this goddess with the sun behind her head does convey power. And this is the reason I think that Guadalupe is, is born so early after the conquest. Because of Mary's very powerful role in conquering um, the native peoples. Here we have Mary, the battle banner used by Cortez during the conquest. And the right hand side, we have Tonantzin, a representation of Tonantzin. This is a stone figure of Tonantzin found at the Museo Nacional um, Las Intervenciones in Mexico City. Powerful. So Guadalupe. Plus Tonantzin equals drum roll, please. I think you all know, right? Guadalupe. Guadalupe. The word is called syncretism. S syncretism is when two, two religious symbols from diverging cultures or different cultures come together to create something new. Guadalupe. This happens all throughout Europe as Christianity spreads, right? Mary herself is a combination of the idea of a young Jewish girl and the Greek goddesses. The very first church to Mary was first the Temple of Diana in Ephesus. Right? This happens throughout Europe. Who knows Spanish? So this is, the, this is what's around the banner. Este estandarte fue el que trajo Don Fernando Cortez en la conquista de México. Right, this banner was carried by, by Don Fernando Cortez in the conquest of Mexico. Powerful. Again, here... Here's a representation of this banner. It's not an angel. It's, I think, I'm pretty much, I'm pretty sure it's Mary, but it's how they represented Mary on that banner. The Codex Azcatitlan, depicting the Spanish Tlaxcalan army with Cortez and La Malinche, along with an African slave in front of the meeting with Montezuma. So they were Africans with Columbus and Cortez and Arabs and Jews, right? If your last name is Perez, that was originally a Jewish last name. In every Spanish name, like Fernandez and Hernandez, that ends with Z, that was originally Arab. Here's another depiction of the, the Virgin Mary banner. Look how large the Virgin Mary is. Look at the baby Jesus, he looks dead. The powerful one in this image is Mary, isn't it? It's like his head slumps to the side. The focus is not on Jesus. It's like a little rag doll there. The focus is on his powerful female goddess, Mary. Mary is a powerful image and presence. We look at this and we just see an image, right? At this time, she would have been a presence, a powerful presence leading the conquistadors to conquer the Mexica. And the Mexica would have seen her as a war god because this is how native peoples went out to battle. We saw in the previous lecture, um, a codex showing the Mexica leaving Aztlan. And as they're walking along, the lead priest is carrying Huitzilipochtli on his back because the god Huitzilipochtli is leading them. Gods lead their peoples. The Mary God is leading the Spanish, and as these native peoples went out to fight, they would have carried their gods with them. 
Question, how did Hernan Cortez with merely a hundred, a few hundred conquistadors conquer an empire totally in the millions? Were the Spanish braver than the Mexica? What do you think? I don't think so. I think the Mexica were very brave, just as brave or even braver, they were defending their homeland. Let's, let's compare, there's, there's, there, are reasons, there are reasons why the Spanish are able to conquer the Mexica. Of course, one is that many of the native peoples around the Mexica hated the Mexica and they joined forces with Hernan Cortes. And I think afterwards they probably regretted it because they brought about, they brought about their own de des demise as a slaves on haciendas eventually. Um, but at first, I think many of them saw Cortez as their savior, who was going to free them from um, the yoke of the Aztec Empire. Unfortunately, that was not the case. They just traded the Aztecs for the Spanish. And in many ways, of course, the Spanish were worse. So let's compare Spanish military technology versus native, Mex native Mexican weaponry. The Spanish swords, knives, armor are made from Toledo steel, the strongest, most pliable steel in the world. Toledo, what is developed in Spain is a, a technology that allows for a stronger, more flexible steel. Um, and the, the typical Spanish sword is about three feet long. It's able to bend and not break, and it's very sharp. Compare this to the native Mexica, Mac Huatil. Um, so the Spanish have swords and the Mexica have wooden clubs with several embedded obsidian blades. So very sharp pieces of, of uh, obsidian, which is rock, but very sharp. In fact, obsidian shards um, can be sharper than a surgeon's scalpel, but it's still rock. And there's no way that wooden clubs with rock blades can match up to Toledo steel. It's impossible. Um, that steel will break through the wooden clubs and smash the rock. You just cannot fight um, wooden clubs against steel swords. Spanish armor made from Toledo steel. Mexica armor made from wood and cotton. And this is fine before the conquest when the Mexica are fighting other native tribes who have similar um, cotton and wood armor, shields. But those shields that are made from um, wood and feathers and cotton are no match for Spanish swords that just break them in half. The Spanish bring cannons, harquebuses, which are muskets, gunpowder, and ships. Um, of course, we know that no one in the New World, the uh, Western Hemisphere, has gunpowder. There are no guns. Um, the cannons and harquebuses and gun, these are all new to the Mexica. They've never seen anything like it. What do the Mexica have? Um, bows and arrows. They don't even have crossbows, they have bows and arrows. Um, the crossbow is so far more powerful and deadly than bows and arrows. And um, the conquistadors bring crossbows. Animals, animals are used in the conquest. War horses and large bull mastiffs, mastiff war dogs. Packs of war dogs were used during the Reconquista against Islamic armies. And they're brought to, the, to um, the New World and used against the Mexica. That's terrifying. Right? Um, horses and any type of beast of burden did not exist in Mexico. In fact, Horses had gone extinct in North America around 11 to 13,000 years before. When the native peoples first see horses, if we can believe the sources, um, they, they think that, that the rider and the horse are some kind of centaur. They don't, they, don't, they don't know what they're looking at at first. Terror, 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 terror. All these, all these things to the natives are they're terrifying. Imagine never seeing a cannon before and, and you see this object that, that 
yells like thunder and people die when it yells. Or muskets, people die when this, 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 I, this, this thing shouts and when it shouts, um, people die. It's terrifying. Bull masses are terrifying. War horses are terrifying. This all inflicts terror on the native peoples. Cortez and the conquistadors were there to rape, rob, and destroy. This is their mission. Now, of course, Cortez would say he was there to spread, to spread the gospel. And to us, we might think that it's um, contradictory, that you cannot possibly be a Christian and want to, to destroy. Well, I would ask you, why not? We have this modern idea, especially in America and in modern times, that, that true religion is peaceful. Where is that role written? In fact, throughout human history, religion has often been very violent. That's why we have gods of war. Mars, Ares, Athena, Yahweh in the Old Testament, Quetzalcoatl, which they potentially are tied to war. They lead nations into war to kill people. This idea that religion is supposed to be peaceful um, is a very modern, very modern idea. And in fact, throughout most of history, this is not the case. Read the Old Testament, one of the bloodiest books ever written. Um, and the God of the Old Testament, what, what does the God of the Old Testament tell Moses, Joshua, and Caleb. Well, not Moses. Remember, he has to stay behind because he committed a sin. What does what the God of the Hebrews tell them when he says, I've given you this promised land? What do they have to do? He's given them this promised land, but guess what? There's still people living there. And what does God tell them to do to those people? He says, I want you to kill every one of them. I want you to kill every child, every baby, every mother, every grandparent. Kill everyone. And not only that, I want you to kill all their livestock. And God says, I do not want to hear the bleating of one sheep in my ear. Kill everything. Genocide, wipe them out. This is the God of the Old Testament. So the idea that religion is not supposed to be violent, um, I'm not sure who made that rule up, but it's not the case. Um, gods are violent. Especially at this time. And to Cortez and the conquistadors, that wasn't contradictory. They had a commission to spread the gospel um, first by peace. And if the native peoples did not um, convert immediately, then they died. And this was God's will. The conquistadors believed in absolute war and carnage, absolute war. No prisoners kill everyone, just like Joshua and Caleb in the Old Testament. Montezuma was indecisive. Native battles were often based on flower wars concept, not to kill, but to capture. The Mexica had what were called flower wars, where battles were set up with neighboring tribes. And the idea was not to, not to kill on the battlefield, but to capture um, warriors, prisoners of war, to be taken to the great temple afterwards and sacrificed. So as the Spanish are marching, I, I, think, I think their ideas of war aren't the same. And this, this eventually leads to, to their, to their de demise and downfall. There's indecisiveness. There's, they're not sure how, how to proceed in war. And it, it causes their downfall. Disease, disease, smallpox, measles, influenza, Typhus. The DNA of Western Hemisphere peoples had been separated by tens of thousands of years from what is called the Old World, Asia, Africa, and Europe. And, is, and, and, and the immune systems of both types of people had grown differently. The diseases that had, ra had ravished the Old World in Africa and Asia and Europe had built up a tolerance in immunization to certain diseases. When Columbus comes to Hispaniola for the first time, records say that there was an African slave with um, Columbus that had smallpox. When they land, that smallpox spreads like wildfire. 
So by the, the time that Cortez comes to the Tenochtitlan, um, a big part of their, of their um, citizenry had already been wiped out from the smallpox that, Cor that Columbus had ushered in. And Cortez and his men bring it again. And the natives have no immune system, immunity to these diseases. Like you and I, we get the flu. Most of us don't die from the flu, right? We get very sick. Some of us die, but most of us don't. Um, but this totally ravishes the native peoples. Between 20 and 50 million natives die. Up to 95% of natives die in the first few decades. 95% from Argentina, where is today Argentina, all the way to Alaska, the whole Western Hemisphere dies. Mexico's native population drops from 25 million before the conquest to around 1 million 100 years later. Completely devastates native populations, weakens them. Here is a, a shield, it's a beautiful shield. This is a, such a beautiful shield. This is an Aztec shield in Vienna. Now Vienna, Austria has Montezuma's headdress. They won't give it back to Mexico. These objects, I am making a declaration and a statement. These, object, these objects should be given back to Mexico. Vienna has them as a consequence of colonization. Half of Athens is in London. London needs to give all those artifacts back to Athens. All the artifacts of Mexico throughout European museums needs to go back to Mexico. Um, they have no business holding these things anymore to be gawked at by, by visitors. They need to go back to their homelands. But this is a beautiful shield in Vienna, an Aztec shield. That's amazing, it's beautiful made of wooden leather. So this is made of wooden leather and of course feathers. There's no way that this would have uh, withheld or uh, um, stood against a Spanish steel. The Spanish sword would have cut this right in half or um, not protected the, the bear's heart from being stabbed. Here's a, an excerpt from Bernal Diaz de Castillo during um, one of the battles between the Spanish and the natives during their march toward Tenochtitlan. What an opportunity for fine writing the events of this most perilous and uncertain battle presents. We were 400 men, of whom many were sick and wounded, and we stood in the middle of a plain six miles long. Now, please, I'll stop right there. Imagine this. I want you to imagine every word he says. From a military standpoint, this is amazing. There's only 400 men and they're gonna fight thousands of warriors. This is like a movie, right? Like a fictional movie, but it's not fictional. Let's start out, let me see. We were, we were 400 men of whom many were sick and wounded. And we stood in the middle of a plain six miles long and perhaps as broad, swarming with Indian warriors. Moreover, we knew that they had come determined to leave none of us alive except those who, to, who to, to be sacrificed to their idols. When they began to charge the stones, sped, sped like hail from their slings, so they have slings, slingshots. And their barbed and fire-hardened darts fell like corn on the threshing floor, each one capable of piercing any armor or penetrating the unprotected vitals. So they have, they have very sharp um, arrows that could, could penetrate the steel. Their, their swordsmen and spearmen pressed us hard. When, when he said swordsmen, they don't, this is not Spanish steel, these are you know, the wooden clubs with obsidian blades. Their swordsmen and spearmen pressed us hard and closed with us bravely, shouting and yelling as they came. Their steadfastness of our, I'll start over, sorry. The steadfastness of our artillery, musketeers, and bowmen did much to save us, and we inflicted great casualties on them. Their charging swordsmen were repelled by stout thrust from our swords and did not close in on us often as in the previous battle. Our horsemen were skilled and fought so valiantly that after God who protected us, they were our chief bulwark. 
The Indians were charging in such numbers that only by a miracle of sword play, we were able to drive them back and reform our ranks. One thing alone saved our lives. The enemy were so massed and so numerous that every shot wrought havoc among them. What is more, they were so badly led that some of their captains could not bring their men to battle. See, they're pressed together so, so much that when a cannon is fired off, 10 to 15 die at once. Heads lopped off, limbs lopped off, bodies chopped in half. Here is a codex representation of the massacre at Cholula. At the bottom we see heads severed, decapitated, limbs chopped off. A horrible massacre. You can read about this massacre in Bernal Diaz, Del Castillo's account in the conquest of Mexico, um, as well as other native accounts. I want to show you this image. This is Cholula. This is the great temple of Cholula. What stands out to you about this great pyramid of Cholula? So this is the area where the massacre takes place. And remember, I, I said that Cholula was a, a site, a pilgrimage site for devotees of Quetzalcoatl. Here's Quetzalcoatl up here. Right. What stands out to you? The church, right? This is the conquering image. Christianity, Catholicism conquers this religion by placing the church on top, the final emblem of conquest. If you are a native who survives the conquest and every day you walk by your once great pyramid to see a church on the top, what are you thinking? That's, that religion is more powerful. That religion conquered my religion. Now that, that new religion is mine because obviously their gods are more powerful. I think this is the case in, in, in many cases, how, how natives who were left would have viewed um, the conquering religion as simply more powerful. And of course, there's syncretism going on, there's mixing and blending. Um, but I think, I think the main view is that this is a more powerful religion. This is um, the, the extent of the great temple down here that most of it is still unexcavated. And here's the, the church up here. Amazing, isn't it? I haven't gone here yet. I was supposed to go there in January, um, but there's so many things to do in Mexico City. I never got out of Mexico City, but I'm definitely going here after the quarantine. Beautiful. Imagine statues of Quetzalcoatl everywhere. Right? They were destroyed after the conquest. Many of the, uh, the, the statues called idols by the, the conquistadors were destroyed, unfortunately. I'm, I'm very grateful for the ones that we have left. I wish, I wish more would have survived. Here's a, here's a uh, comparison of the different pyramids throughout the world. So in green, this is the green Cholula. In fact, the one at Cholula, let's take it down here. The green is, is the largest as far as um, width, right? How many feet it is across on the ground level. The largest pyramid in the world. Number six, we see the pyramid of Khafran in Egypt. And number five, the golden color is the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. You see it is right here? It's smaller than the width of the Temple of Cholula, but Cholula is not as high. I love this comparison map. Al Castillo, um, Kukulkan, 13, Ch uh, Chichen Itza, over a much smaller pyramid, but still very impressive. Here's Tenochtitlan, Tenochtitlan. Again, when the Spanish first see it. Um, and I'll read that out to you right now. Here's an excerpt from Bernal Diaz del Castillo's account of the conquest of Mexico. I'll just read a little part 
about them entering into Tenochtitlan when they, when they first see Tenochtitlan. <clears throat> we stood there looking about around us for that huge and cursed temple stood so high that from it one could see over everything very well. We saw the three causeways which led into Mexico. That is the causeway of Itzlapapalpa, by which we had entered four days before, and that of Tucuba, and that of Tepaquilla. And we saw the fresh water that comes from Chapultepec, which supplies the city. And we saw the bridges on the three causeways, which were built at certain distances apart, for which the water of the lake flowed in and out from one side to the other. And we beheld on that great lake a great many canoes, some coming with supplies of food, and others returning loaded with cargoes and merchandise. And we saw that from the very house of that great city and of all the other cities that were built in the water, it was impossible to pass from house to house, except by drawbridges, which were made of wood or in canoes. And we saw in those cities temples and oratories, like towers and fortresses, and all gleaming white. And it was a wonderful thing to behold. And then the houses with flat roofs, and on the causeways, other small towers, and oratories, like they were fortresses. After having examined and considered all that we had seen, we turned to look at the great marketplace and the crowds of people that were in it, some buying and others selling, so that the murmur and hum of their voices and words that they used could be heard more than a league off. Some of the soldiers among us who had been in many parts of the world, in Constantinople, in all over Italy, and in Rome, said that so large a marketplace and so full of people and so well regulated and arranged, they had never seen before. Let us leave this and return to our captain, who said to Fray Olmedo, who happened to be near him. It's, this is Cortez talking now. It seems to me, Senor Padre, that it would be a good thing to throw out a feeler to Montezuma and to, as to whether he would allow us to build a church here. And the Padre replied that it would be a good thing if it were successful, but it seemed to him that it was not quite a suitable time to speak about it for Montezuma did not appear to be inclined to such a thing. Then Cortez said to Montezuma, Your Highness, Your Highness is indeed a very great prince and worthy of even greater things. We are rejoiced to see your cities, and as we are here in your temple, what I now beg as a favor is that you will show us your gods. Montezuma replied that he must first speak to his high priest, and we had, when he had spoken to them, he said that we might enter into a small tower in apartments, a sort of hall, where there were two altars with very richly carved boardings on top of the roof. On each altar were two figures, like giants with very tall bodies and very fat. And the first which stood on the right hand said they, it was the figure of Huitzilopochtli, the god of war. It had a very broad face and monstrous and terrible eyes, and the whole of his body was covered with precious stones and gold and pearls, and with seed pearls stuck on with a paste that they make in this country out of a sort of root. And all the body and head was covered with it, and the body was girdled with great snakes made of gold and precious stones, and in one hand he held a bow and the other some arrows. And another small idol that stood by him, they said it was his page. And he held a short, a short lance and a shield, richly decorated with gold and stones. Huichli Pochli had around his neck some Indian faces and other things like hearts of Indians. The former made of gold and the latter of silver with many precious blue stones. There were some braziers with incense, which they called copal, and in them they were burning the hearts of three Indians who they had sacrificed that day. 
and they had made the sacrifice with smoke and copal. All the walls of the oratory were so splashed and encrusted with blood that they were black. The floor was the same and the whole place stank vilely. Then we, on the other side, on the left-hand side, there stood the other great image, the same, the same height as Huixley Pochtli. And he had a face like a bear and eyes that shone made of their mirrors, which they called Tescat. And the body plastered with precious stones like that of Huixley Pochtli. For they had that, for they say that the two were brothers. And this Tescatli Puka was the god of hell and had the charge of souls of the Mexicans. And his body was girt with figures like little devils with snakes' tails. The walls were so clotted with blood and the soil so bathed within it that in the slaughterhouses of Spain, there is not such, an, uh, there is not a, such another stench. They had offered to this idol five hearts from the day's sacrifices. In the highest part of the temple, there was a recess of which the woodwork was very richly worked. And in it was another half man, half lizard, his precious stones all over it, and, and half of the body was covered with a mantle. They say the body of this figure is full of the seeds that there are in the world. And they say that in, it is the God of seed time and harvest. But I do not remember its name. And everything was covered with blood, both walls and altar, and the stench was such that we could hardly wait the moment to get out of it. They had an exceedingly large drum there, and when they beat it, the sound of it was so dismal and like, so to say, an instrument of infernal regions, hell. That's the excerpt from Bernal Diaz as they enter um, into Tenochtitlan and into the palace and great temple that we see here in the middle, the Plaza Mayor, the Temple Mayor, sorry. This back, I should have showed you this before, this backtrack. Um, this is when they first come over the mountain range and they see this for the first time. This is Bernal Diaz writing. And we saw all those cities and villages built in the water and other great towns on dry land and that straight and level causeway leading to Mexico, Tenochtitlan, we were astounded. Those great towns and queues, or temples, and buildings rising from the water, all made of stone, seemed like an enchanted vision from the tale of Amadis. Now, Amadis was a, a romance tale of adventure. Um, romance adventure novels were big in Spain at this time, and um, all, a lot of the conquistadors were readers of these romance novels. <laughs> In, indeed, some of us soldiers, some of our soldiers asked whether it was not all a dream. It is not surprising, therefore, that I should write in this vein. It was all so wonderful. I do not know how to describe this first glimpse of things never heard of, seen, or dreamed of before. That always gives me chills when I read this. Bernal Diaz is 80 years old when he's writing this account. And as most people, when we get old, we become very, I'm not that old yet, but I've read enough history to know that when people get old, they become very re reflective and maybe even remorseful. And there are glimpses of remorse throughout Bernal Diaz's account where you can picture him writing this at 80 years old but with candlelight, remembering how beautiful things were. And you can see here that I think there's a little remorse, right? He's remembering how beautiful he, he believed it was, but then afterward they, they destroy it. And when we entered the city of Itz, Itzapalapa, the site of the palaces in which, we, in which they lodged us, they were, they were very spacious and well-built of magnificent stone, cedar wood, and the wood of other sweet-smelling trees with great rooms and courts, which were a wonderful sight, and all covered with awnings of woven cotton. Well, that sounds so beautiful, doesn't it? That sounds magnificent. Like I said, one of the greatest tragedies in human history is the destruction of Tenochtitlan. 
this is the great temple. This is the great temple after the destruction of the conquest. The surviving Mexica were forced to take apart their great temple. And with the same stones and bricks, were forced to build the first cathedral to the Christian gods. The fight, that's a powerful weapon of conquest. Not only are people die, dead, the Mexican are dead and wiped out through smallpox and, and the sword, but those who, are, who survive have to rebuild the new civilization with the building materials from their, their, their original civilization. Think about what that means to someone's psyche. Right. What if, let's put it in modern terms, what if, God forbid, America was invaded? The Chinese invade America. They go to Washington, D.C., and they force all of American leaders into physical hard labor to tear down the White House and to build a new structure with the same building materials that the White House wants. Similar, right? Or if the Vatican, if Rome was invaded, by various forces, and the Vatican was demolished, um, St. Peter's, and with the same building materials, um, a new sort of temple was built to another religion. Oh, sorry, I took these pictures. <laughs> these are the pictures I took in January of 2019. And I encourage all of you to go there after the quarantine, get a, get a plane ticket from Fresno to Mexico City and go see the Templo Mayor and go see Teotihuacan, Urotepeyek, where the Virgin appeared to Juan Diego. I think it was 1531, 1535, around there. Go to these places. Um, extraordinary experience. Go to Chapultepec and to the museums there. At Chapultepec Castle, um, the boy heroes, fought against the American army. Many say it's a myth, but I, I believe in the myth. <laughs> Here's Quetzalcoatl, this the serpent, feathered serpent deity, um, among the ruins of the destroyed Templo Mayor. Quetzalcoatl. 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 This is a previous image I showed you from Teotihuacan. Now at Tenochtitlan. Let's, another as, another um, aspect of the conquest is religion, right? I, we talked about this a couple of times. Religious, the war of religious icons. When the Spanish first get to the new world, what, what's called a new world in their perspective, um, they already believe that they are, they are on a mission to, as God's warriors. They had just fought Islam for a few hundred, several hundred years, and they bring that great enthusiasm. And the word enthusiasm means God in you, in theos. Right? So they bring this God, they're possessed by the spirits to spread God's will and to fight the devil. And they already have the idea to fight the devil. And what do they see when they land in Mexico? Bloodstained altars, human sacrifices, dragon gods from their perspective. How was the devil portrayed in Europe at this time, or in many ways, and throughout many eras, as a great dragon, right? Satan, the great dragon. And they see dragons everywhere in Cholula, the dragon city, from their perspective. It just it's, it, it fits all within the cosmology already. It's all a, a horrendous coincidence that all these images already fit into what they're thinking. Here is Satan before them as the dragon god. Of course they're God's missionaries in their minds are thinking this, right? Of course God wants us here to fight the dragon god, fight these bloodstained altars to destroy them, to place an image of the Virgin Mary on top of the great temple in Tenochtitlan. This is what they do, the final step of conquest is to place an image of the Virgin on top of the, the great temple. And the very last thing to conquer Mexico City is the Virgin. 
here's some images from Europe, right? How the devil's portrayed. Here is Mag Saint Michael defeating the defeating Satan. And this fits into the conquest. This fits into the imagery of the conquest. Saint Michael and the, Michael and the dragon. This fits into the. This is before the conquest, but this fits right into the conquest. These are the conquistadors in their perspective fighting Quetzalcoatl, fighting Satan in the New World. It's all so weirdly, perfectly coincidental. Saint George fighting the dragon. This goes even back further before Christianity with um, the Kraken. In, in ancient Greek uh, mythology, which, which evolves into this Christian mythology, which feeds right into the conquest. Right. Quetzalcoatl, unfortunately, fits into this idea of the devil. Horrible coincidence. These are my photos again, walking around the Temple of Mayor. Again, Quetzalcoatl. Imagine on these steps, on these steps, the final battle was taking place between the Eagle Warriors, the Mexica, and the Conquistadors. As the Conquistadors stormed the Great Temple during the final moments of, of the Great Battle of Tenochtitlan. You can imagine the Conquistadors laying here crying for their moms, Eagle Warriors with their limbs chopped off by Toledo steel in a great battle raging. Drums beating, um, the surviving Mexica, Mexica grabbing Spaniards and, and sacrificing them on the altars um, before the final moments of the, the conquest. This is a powerful image right here is the foundation of the great pyramid and in the, in the, the foreground or background, um, the Mexican Cathedral. Powerful image. The religious conquest of Mexico. And as I go to the left, um, the museum, the Plaza Mayor, uh, the Temple Mayor Museum is there. I think it was more powerful as a reminder of the conquest that the Spanish left this foundation, right? So that those surviving Mexica would be reminded that they were conquered, that their civilization was destroyed. Every new generation of Nahuas and, and um, natives would walk past this and remember that they were conquered. The Spanish gods and civilization conquered theirs. Here's the death of Montezuma, portrayed in the Florentine Codex. The last sovereign reigning Tlatoani. Cuauhtémoc was made emperor after him, sort of like a freedom fighting emperor, but he was eventually caught and killed by the, murdered by the Spanish also, Cuauhtémoc. Here is a powerful, the most powerful excerpt from Bernal Diaz. So take a look at, Again, at that, at that. And perhaps Bernal Diaz is thinking about these ruins and the great carnage that happened in Mexico when he's 80 years old in Spain when he writes this. When we had taken a good look at all of this, we went to the orchard and garden, which was a marvelous place both to see and walk in. I was never tired of noticing the diversity of trees. And this is Tenochtitlan again, right? He's describing Tenochtitlan. I was never tired of noticing the diversity of trees and the various scents given off by each and the paths choked with roses and other flowers and the many local fruits, fruit trees and rose bushes and the ponds of fresh water. Then there were, there were birds of many breeds and varieties which came to the pond. I see again 
that I stood looking at it, and I thought that no land like it would ever be discovered in the whole world. But today, all that I then saw is overthrown and destroyed. Nothing is left standing. I think one of the most powerful lines in all of human history are those lines. Let's read, let's read it again. I say again that I stood looking at it. Imagine he's, he's, he's remembering, he's 80 years old, he's remembering himself when he's in his 30s. And he's remembering what he thought at that time in 1521 when he's standing in Tenochtitlan. And he's looking around him thinking, this, is, this place is so amazing. I've never seen such a beautiful place. Rome, Sevilla, Castile, Florence. Can't match this place. These beautiful gardens, these birds, these flowers, these ponds. And he writes, I say again that I stood looking at it and thought that no lands like it would ever be discovered in the whole world. But today, all that I then saw is overthrown and destroyed. Nothing is left standing. And that, that is the conquest of Mexico. Well, that wraps up our lecture on the conquest of Mexico. To me, personally, as an historian, one of the greatest tragedies in human history, and we know that there are many, many human tragedies. With this, this once beautiful city, Bernal Diaz says that it was the most beautiful city he had ever seen. I'm paraphrasing him. I mean, as he stood there, looking out at Tenochtitlan and thought that there would never be another city like it. And then they destroy it.